In this session, let us talk about frequency response of a system. Okay, what is meant by a frequency response? The frequency response may be written in terms of the system poles and zeros by substituting j omega. That means once we know the transfer function, let us say we know the transfer function h of s. Okay, then when I replace s with the j omega, then that will give me the response in terms of the frequency, also called as the frequency response because of the term involved omega. Okay, so we can directly substitute s into the factored form of the transfer function. Okay, so when I directly substitute j omega, s is equal to j omega directly into the factored form where you know the uh, numerator and denominator gives us uh, the zeros and the poles. So, let us look at one equation h of s has been replaced as a z here by j omega. So, h of j omega where s is equal to j omega, h of j omega is equal to k gaining factor into j omega minus z1, j omega minus z2, so on up to j omega minus z m minus 1 and j omega minus z m. That means, the number of zeros are m zeros. Similarly, in the denominator you have j omega minus p 1, j omega minus p 2, j omega minus p n minus 1, j omega minus p n that is you have n number of poles. So, uh, what we have done here, here is when I want to get the frequency response of a system, we are finding the h of s for a system in terms of its Laplace transform, the transform function h of s, we are replacing s is equal to j omega and h of j omega we are writing instead of h of s. Again, uh, wherever s is present, we are replacing it with uh, j omega and in the equation which you have just seen, uh, there are m number of zeros and n number of poles. Let us move on. The frequency response is a transfer function evaluated on the imaginary axis of the s plane that is when s is equal to j omega. So, imaginary axis j is there is not it. So, whenever we want to find the frequency response, we are interested in the imaginary axis of the s plane that is the j omega axis. Okay, the graphical method for evaluating the transfer function described above may be applied directly to the frequency response. So, each of the vectors from the n system poles to test point s is equal to j omega has a magnitude and an angle. So, every s is equal to j omega has a certain magnitude and a certain angle. So, what are the magnitude and angles given by? The magnitude is given by, we are writing about the poles j omega minus p i is equal to sigma i square plus omega minus omega i is called square and what is the angle at s is equal to p i is equal to tan inverse omega minus omega i by sigma i. So, you have to remember this every uh, this thing equation has a magnitude and a pole which you have to calculate. We are talking about a single pole s is equal to uh, at existing at a pole i that is uh, there is existence of the pole. Now, if I want to find out the magnitude and phase for the whole uh, system response then that is given by the magnitude and the phase of the complete frequency response may be written in terms of the magnitude and angles of these component vectors, the different component vectors is not it. Summation of all this results into the overall magnitude and phase of the system and what is the equation here? H of j omega is given by k and you see in the numerator the summation from i is equal to 1 to uh, pi i is equal to 1 to m j omega minus z i divided by pi i is equal to 1 to n j omega minus p i because we assume that the number of poles are n and number of zeros are assumed to be m. Similarly, what is the angle h of j omega is equal to i is equal to 1 to m j omega minus z i minus i is equal to 1 to n j omega minus p i. So, that is how you get the uh, angle and the magnitude of the frequency response. Now, if the vector from the pole p i that is a pole which is existing at i to the point s is equal to j omega has a length equal to q i and an angle equal to d i from the horizontal. So, this is very important when you represent them graphically. So, you have to look at these two points. What is that first point? The vector from the pole p i to the point s is equal to j omega has a length q i, we are assuming it has a length of q i and an angle is represented by theta i from the horizontal and the vector from the 0 z i to the point j omega has a length r i and an angle phi i. Okay. So, we are taking the length of the vector for a pole as q and the angle as theta whereas, for a 0 we are taking it as r and the angle as phi. Uh, now, the value of the frequency response at the point j omega is given by this following equation. So, what is that magnitude j omega is equal to k that is a gaining factor r 1 up to r m 
divided by q1 up to qn. So, h of j omega is equal to magnitude of h of j omega is equal to k r1 to rn divided by q1 to qn. Similarly, what is the angle of this? The angle is given by psi 1, so up to psi m okay, minus theta 1 up to theta n. Now, the graphical method can be very useful for deriving a qualitative picture of a system frequency response. Okay. For example, consider sinusoidal response of first order system with a pole on the real axis s is equal to 1 minus 1 by tau. Okay. So, let us see an example. In this example, we are considering sinusoidal response of a first order system where a pole is on the real axis and it is at s is equal to minus 1 by tau. Now, this is I, I am showing you in the next figure. This figure shows the magnitude response and also the Bode plot for this. If you see here, the, the vector length is given as q1 and q2 with the angles face angles of uh, theta 1 and theta 2, where again p is set to exist just minus 1 by tau. So, it is existing there and this, this is the length from the pole to the j omega axis. And if you see here, the angle is theta 1 for the first one with a uh, magnitude of q1 and the second case the magnitude of q2 and theta 2. As no zeros are given, we are not talking about the magnitude of the 0 to the j omega axis. Similarly, you can also see the Bode plot. Now, even though the gain constant k cannot be determined from the pole 0 plot, observations may be made directly by noting the behavior of the magnitude and angle of the vector from the pole to the imaginary axis as the input is varied. Okay, because that k h of s or h of j omega is equal to k into we have seen is not it, where uh, you know, we have written in terms of zeros in the numerator and poles in the denominator, there k is actually we cannot determine from the pole 0 plot, but we can make observations directly from the graphical representation which we have just seen in the earlier slide. So, what is that we have to see? Observations may be made directly by noting the behavior of the magnitude and the angle of the vector from the pole to the imaginary axis as the input is varied. So, I can calculate if you vary the input what I can calculate? I can calculate the qi and also I can calculate the theta i if the pole is given or I can calculate the ri and I also can calculate the phi i if the input is varying. The input is varying as you all are aware, the zeros and poles positions also vary. So, from the graph I can actually calculate both the magnitude and the phase of the equation. Now, there are certain very important observations we are making. So, all of you have to remember this. The first point I am making here is at low frequencies the gain approach is a finite value and the phase angle has a small but finite lag. So, as we are talking about the frequency response, this is the first point in that at what happens at low frequencies the gain approaches a finite value okay? and the phase angle has a small but finite lag. Now, what happens if I increase the input frequency as the input frequency is increased the gain decreases why because the length of the vector is increasing and the phase lag also increases because the angle of the vector also becomes larger. So, as we move from low frequency to high frequencies that as we move on what happens the gain gets reduced because of the fact that the length of the vector that is q i increases and also the phase lag also increases because the angle of the vector becomes larger. Okay, these are two points and then you have another point. Now, as we move on increasing the frequency so what happens we reach the high frequency range At high frequencies what happens the gain approaches 0 and what will happen to the phase angle? The phase angle now becomes pi by 2. So, these are the very three important points. What happens at low frequencies? The gain is finite okay? and as I increase the frequencies, the gain is getting reduced and at very frequ high frequencies, what is happening? The gain is approaching 0 and what about the phase angle? The phase angle is approaching pi by 2. Now, let us look at another example. Earlier, we have seen a first order system. Now, let us look at a second order system. A damping ratio zeta sp is given that the pair of complex conjugate pairs are located close to the imaginary axis. That is again one important point. What is happening here is we are taking a second order system with a damping ratio chosen so that the pair of complex conjugate poles are located 
close to the imaginary axis. As a second order system, we have pair of complex conjugate poles and we are ensuring that they are very close to the imaginary axis. So, the figure shows in the next as you see here, the pole is very close to the imaginary axis. You have complex conjugate poles which is existing at a P1 and P2 because the second order system right. And you also have the approximate uh, magnitude plot and also the uh, phase plot of the given equation. Uh, as you see in the figure, the two poles, one existing at P1 and, and uh, other existing at P2, these are complex conjugate poles and also the assumption which you have made, we are ensured that these are staying very close to the imaginary axis. If you see uh, carefully at the figure, there are a pair of vectors connecting the two poles to the imaginary axis as we have shown there. Okay, if you see here, uh, pair of vectors are there, if you see one from the pole uh, P1 and that is connecting to j omega 2 and j omega 1. Similarly, P 2 also is connected to j omega 1 and j omega 2. So, there are pair of vectors connecting to the two poles to the imaginary axis. So, P 1 is connecting at two places to the omega axis and P 2 is also connecting to the two uh, parts of the imaginary axis. Now, let us make some conclusions. How the lengths and angles of the vectors change as the test frequency moves up the imaginary frequencies. So, we are talking about how your system behaves as the test frequency moves up the imaginary axis. Okay, so, let us again look at the first point. The first point says at low frequencies there is a finite but undetermined gain and a small but finite phase lag associated with the system as we have seen earlier in the first order system. Here also similarly low frequencies there is a finite but you know the gain cannot be calculated at least from the graph given to us from the pole 0 plot and phase lag is also finite that is associated with the system. As the input frequency is increased and the test point on the imaginary axis approaches the pole on the vectors associated with the pool in the second quadrant decreases in length and at some point reaches a minimum. Now, what is happening as I am increasing the frequency the test point on the imaginary axis approaches the pole one of the on the on of one of the vectors associated with the pole in the second quadrant decreases in length and a sub point reaches a minimum. Third point if you see there is an increase in the value of the magnitude function over a range of frequencies close to the pole. So, okay, there is an increase in the value of magnitude functions when I uh, increase the frequency you have a lot of frequency components. So, as we move on increasing the frequency the value of the magnitude function also increases. What happens at very high frequencies? At very high frequencies, if you see the lengths of both the vectors tend to infinity and the magnitude of the frequency response tends to 0, while the phase approaches an angle of pi radians and because the angle of each vector approaches pi by 2. This is at very high frequencies. This is how a second order system behave. Now, based on this, I can make some generalizations whenever we talk about a sinusoidal frequency response of a linear system and that too on the basic generic interpretations of the pole 0 plot. Let us see this here clearly. Mm, the generalizations made about the sinusoidal frequency response of a linear system based on the generic interpretation of the pole 0 plot. The first point if you look at if a system has an excess of poles over the number of zeros, the magnitude of the frequency response tends to 0 as the frequency becomes large. If you have a system has more number of poles than the number of zeros that is we have taken if you have taken m as a number of zeros and n as a number of poles here n is greater than m that means the number of poles are greater than number of zeros and what is happening if a system has an excess of poles over the number of zeros the magnitude of the frequency response tends to 0 as the frequency becomes large this is the first generalization which we are making. Similarly, continuation of the first point if a system has an excess of zeros the gain increases without bound as the frequency of the input increases. So, what is happening if the number of poles are greater than number of zeros the gain is decreasing. Similarly, if, uh, if we have an excess of zeros that means m is the number of zeros is greater than n the number of poles and what is happening the gain is increasing without bounds as the frequency of input increases that is the gain is tending towards infinity. But when I look at a physical energetic systems it cannot happen as it implies an infinite power gain through the system. So, any, any physically realizable system cannot have well powers which are 
infinite. So, this cannot happen in a physical energetic systems because it implies an infinite power gain through the system. Let us look at the second generalized point which we are making. If a system has a pair of complex conjugate poles close to the imaginary axis, the magnitude of the frequency response has a peak or resonance at frequencies in the proximity of the pole. If you look at this, uh, the figure earlier which I tried to show you, if you see here, if you look at the magnitude figure, you see here there is a resonance that is occurring at the location of the pole. So, we are talking about this point, let us move on to the uh, same point again. So, as you have uh, seen the figure again where a pair of complex conjugate poles are close to the manual axis. The magnitude of the frequency response is a peak as you have seen or resonance at frequencies in the proximity of the pole. So, frequencies nearer to the pole have higher values which we call as a peak values or also we see the system is resonating at these frequencies which are nearer to the pole. Okay. If the pole pair directly lies on the manual axis, the system exhibits an infinite gain at that frequency. So, we are talking about poles which are nearer to the manual axis. If the pole exists on the manual axis, what happens? The gain becomes infinite. Earlier we have said as close it is to the manual axis, the peak or the resonance occurs at that frequencies which are near to the pole. So, if the pole exists on the imaginary axis itself, the gain becomes infinite finite. This is a generalized statement which you are making in the um, about a system. Let us move to the third general statement which we are uh, trying to uh, arrive at. What is the third point says? The third point says if a system has a pair of complex conjugate zeros close to the imaginary axis, the frequency response has a dip or what we call as a notch in its magnitude function at frequencies in the vicinity of the zero. So, when we have generalized about the existence of a pole near the imaginary axis, we have found that there is a magnitude peak or resonance at frequencies nearer to the pole. But when I have a complex conjugate zeros, what happens is there is a dip also called as a notch, peak or resonance, dip or a notch which exists at the frequencies nearer to the existence of the zero. And if the pair of zeros lie directly on the imaginary axis, the response is identically 0 at the frequency of the 0 and the system does not respond to at all to sinusoidal exaggeration at that frequency. This is a very important point which we are making. When the zeros directly lie on the imaginary axis, what is happening? The response is identically 0 at that frequency of the system where the 0 is existing and the system does not respond at all to any sinusoidal input excitation I gave at that particular frequency. So, the system is not reacting at that frequency where the 0 is lying on the imaginary axis. Now, the fourth point of this is a pole at the origin of the S plane corresponding to pure integration term in the transfer function implies an infinite gain at the 0 frequency. So, what is happening? A pole at the origin of the S plane corresponding to pure integration term in the transfer function implies an infinite gain at the 0 frequency. If it, I mean it is existing at the origin, is not it? So, that means in the transfer function I have a term which is purely integrable. Similarly, in the fifth point we talk about a 0. What does a 0 say? If a 0 is at the origin of the S plane corresponding to pure differentiation, whenever I talk about a 0 is differentiation, when I talk about a pole it is integration implies a 0 gain for the system at the 0 frequency. So, pole existing at the origin or at 0, then the gain is infinite at that particular point of frequency. At 0 frequency, the gain of the system is infinite. If a 0 is existing at the origin, it means that the gain of the system is 0 at the frequency of which is equal to the existence of 0 that is at the origin. Okay, these are the very few important points which you have seen. We have spoken about what a pole uh, is contributing to the gain of a system, the magnitude of a system and the angle of a system and also how 0 is contributing to the angle and the magnitude of the system and how exactly the gain is moving with increase in frequency. So, these 5 points let us just summarize quickly once again so that you know they are very important to us. Okay? These are generalized statements which we are making which are applicable to any system based upon the existence of the pole or the 0. Now, let us look at the first point again, it is a small repetition. 
if existence system has an excess of poles what is happening over the number of zeros that means the number of poles are greater than the number of zeros the magnitude of the frequency response tends to zero as the frequency becomes large as we move on what happens the magnitude of the frequency response is becoming zero this is purely on the fact that the pole are greater than the number of zeros similarly if a system has more number of zeros what is happening the gain increases without bound that is gain is tending towards frequency tending towards infinity this is only applicable when the frequency is increasing but when we talk about a physically realized system it implies an infinite power switch uh, of the system which is not physically realizable similarly if you look at a second point if a system has a pair of complex conjugate poles and these are located close to the imaginary axis then the magnitude of the frequency response has a peak or what we call as a resonance at the frequencies in the proximity of the pole so the frequencies nearer to the existence of the pole there is a increase in magnitude or we what we call as a peak or we say the system is resonating at that frequencies at the frequencies which are nearer which are closer to the pole if the pole lies directly on the imaginary axis then what happens the system exhibits an infinite gain at the frequency that means the peak of your magnitude plot is becoming infinity similarly when you look at zeros which are very close to the imaginary axis then what happens the frequency has a dip or we call it we call as a notch in its magnitude function okay at frequencies in the vicinity of the zero should the pair of zeros lie directly upon the imaginary axis the response is identically zero as a frequency at the zero and the system does not respond at all to sinusoidal excitation at that frequency so there is a very important point which you are making here if the zeros are lying on the imaginary axis itself then the gain is identically zero and the frequency mm, or the system does not respond to any excitation which is sinusoidal in nature at that frequency where the zeros are lying on the imaginary axis this is the third important point okay well, let us recollect again the fourth point what does the fourth point say if the pole is at the origin that is the pole is existing on the zero at the origin then what happens it implies an infinite gain at that zero frequency similarly if a zero is existing on origin best plane implies a zero gain for the system at zero frequency okay let's move on and try to understand what is a gain margin and what is a phase margin what are gain and phase margins let us move on now let us look at a system here it has two blocks here one with the k which is a variable constant gain and we have another plant which is having a transfer function of g of s okay which is under consideration this plant this is what we are trying to design here then let us define what is a gain margin for such a system gain margin is defined as a change in the open loop gain required to make the system unstable so how much changes so we can actually start changing and the change which actually makes your system unstable is the gain margin so when i talk about a system with a greater gain margin it means it can withstand greater changes in system parameters before becoming unstable in a closed loop keep in mind that unity gain in magnitude is equal to gain of zero in decibels so what is that now when we talk about a system with greater gain margins it means i can withstand greater changes in the system when i put back in a closed loop we are talking about open loop gain margin gain margin as you see here the definition is what change in open loop gain required to make the system unstable that means if there are any parameters that going into the design of a system if the parameters are varying if the gain margin is big it means that larger variation the parameter does not make my system unstable in the closed loop so that is one uh, important point so gain bigger the gain margin bigger the parameters but you should also be careful about the type of design we are looking at if the parameters are changing then probably some systems may not work at all so look at all other issues but when we look at solely at the gain margin this is what is going to happen here so remember that unit gain in magnitude is always equal to gain of zero in decibels let us look at phase margin what is phase margin phase margin is defined as a change in the open loop phase shift required to make a closed loop system unstable is defined as a change in the open loop phase shift required to make a closed loop system unstable what is phase margin difference in phase between the phase curve and 
minus 1 at degree at the point correspond to the frequency that gives us a gain of 0 dB. The gain crossover frequency we are representing it as WGC. Likewise, gain margin is the difference between the magnitude curve and 0 dB at the point corresponding to the frequency that gives us a phase of minus 180 degrees. The phase crossover frequency is called as WPC. Okay, let us look at this figure. You see here both the WGC and the WPC here where you know we can see the gain margin and also the phase margin. This is exactly occurring at the crossovers. Now, let us look at Nyquist stability criteria in short because you will study this in control systems, but just to include uh, some few points we have included here Nyquist stability criterion, but Nyquist plots and all those things are read in control systems. Now, let us look at Nyquist plot. What does it say? It allows us to predict the stability and performance of a closed loop system by observing its open loop behavior. So, this is very much related to the phase loop gain and the open loop gain. Okay? The Nyquist criterion can be closed for design purposes regardless of open loop stability where board design methods assume that the system is stable in open loop. Likewise, criterion does not bother about whether the system is having open loop stability or closed loop stability, whereas the Bode plot which you draw insists on or assumes that the system is stable in open loop. Now, therefore, we use this criterion that is Nyquist stability criterion to determine closed loop stability when the Bode plots display confusing information. Whenever the Bode plot gives us some confusion, we come back to the Nyquist stability criterion. The Nyquist diagram is basically a plot of g of j w where g of s is open loop transfer function and omega is a vector of frequencies which encloses the entire right half s plane. In drawing the Nyquist diagram, both positive and negative frequencies from 0 to infinity are taken into account. In the illustration which you are going to see in the next slide, the positive frequencies are shown in red color and the negative frequencies are shown in green color as you see here. The frequency vector used in plotting the Nyquist diagram usually looks like this. You can also imagine these plots stretching out to infinity, you know, isn't it? It is going on to infinity where you know the positive frequencies are tending towards infinity and also the negative frequencies are tending towards infinity. However, if we have open loop poles or zeros on the j omega axis, g of s will not be defined at those points and we must loop around them. Then we are plotting the contour. Okay? Such a contour would look like this. So, this contour actually shows us you know a method where we, uh, we have open poles or zeros which are lying on the j omega axis. Then I should uh, g of s will not be defined at these points and we must plot around these that means the contour looks something like this in the figure shown. Now, from this how do you define a gain margin? The gain margin is defined as a change in open loop gain expressed in decibels required at 180 degrees of phase shift to make the system unstable. Okay, this is the gain margin which we are talking with respect to the Nyquist stability criterion. So, gain margin is defined as a change in open loop gain expressed in decibels required at 180 degrees of phase shift to make the system unstable. First of all, let us say that we have a system that is stable and if there are no Nyquist encirclements of minus 1 such as you know the equation given here 50 by s cube plus 9 square plus 30 s plus 40. Okay, looking at the roots, we find that we have no open loop poles in the right half s plane and therefore, there are no closed loop planes poles on the right half plane if there are no Nyquist encirclements of minus 1. So, if we look at the roots, we see that there are no open poles, open loop poles on the right half s plane and therefore, no closed poles in the right half s plane if there are no Nyquist encirclements of minus 1. Now, how much can we vary the gain before the system becomes unstable in a closed loop is what we have to think about. Okay? The open loop system represented by this plot will become unstable in closed loop if the gain is increased past a certain boundary. So, there is a gain difference which is clearly shown in the figure before you know that is before the closed loop instability and then you have to see at what boundary does this happen. Okay. Similarly, a phase margin, phase margin is a change in open loop phase shift required at unity gain to make a closed loop system unstable. So, phase margin uh, is defined as a change in open loop phase shift required at unity gain to make a closed loop system unstable. From our previous example, we see that this particular system will be unstable in a closed loop if the Nyquist diagram encircles the minus 1 point.
However, we must also realize that if the diagram is shifted by theta degrees, it will then touch the minus 1 point at the negative real axis making the system marginally stable in case of closed loop. Therefore, the angle required to make the system marginally stable in closed loop is called the phase margin and is measured of course in degrees. Now, in order to find the point, we measure this angle from, we draw a circle with a radius of 1, find the point in the Nyquist diagram with a magnitude of 1 that is a gain of 0 dB and measure the phase shift needed for this point to be at an angle of 180 degrees. That is what is shown in this figure. Okay, you see the theta here in this axis. Now, we move on. We move on to a topic called as design of digital filters. How do we design digital filters? So far in our session today, we have talked about the frequency response. We also described what is the gain margin, what is the phase margin. We have used a pole zero plot and we also used an equal stability criterion to understand a little better about the gain margin and the phase margin. Now, all this that we have studied will help us in the design of a digital filters. Now, let us have understanding what is a digital filter, how does it work, what are the general points we have in designing a digital filter. We are not particularly designing a certain specified filter, but we look at the general guidelines which uh, help us in the design of digital filters. So, okay, let us understand this in detail. So, what is this in the design of frequency selective filters? The desired filter characteristics are specified in the frequency domain in terms of the desired magnitude and phase response of the filter. So, when I want to a certain frequency selective filter, what are the specifications we give? We give the specifications as this is my magnitude and this should be the phase response of my filter. That is what are the specifications given to us. Now, in the filter design process, we determine the coefficients of a causal FIR filter or IR filter that closely approximates the desired frequency response specifications. So, I give a specification. So, I go into um, the determining the coefficients of either a causal FIR filter or I go into what is called as an IIR filter. So, which closely matches the specifications given. The issue of which type of filter is used, whether I use FIR or IIR filter depends on the nature of the problem and on the specifications of desired frequency response. Now, I have to choose which type of filter should I go for? Should I go for an FIR filter or should I go for an IIR filter? How does this depend on? This depends on one point that is the nature of the problem and also on the specifications of the desired frequency response. So, invariably let us generalize where we use FIR filters and where we use IIR filters. FIR filters generally are used in filtering problems where there is a requirement for a linear phase characteristics within the pass band of the filter. So, have, we have a band of frequencies which are supposed to pass through the filter. Then I use FIR filter only if there is a requirement of a linear phase characteristics within the pass band of the filter. If there is no requirement for a linear phase characteristics, either I can use an IIR filter or I can also use an FIR filter. So, the choice is yours. General rule, what does it say? An IIR filter has lower side lobes in the stop band than a FIR filter having same parameters. That means, in the stop band, IR filter has less number of lower side lobes, has lower side lobes. That's, that means, the side lobes are not that significant when I design an IR filter in the stop band. Then, comparatively, when I use an FR filter for the same parameters, I designed an FR filter and IR filter. FR filter has lower side lobes in the stop band having the same space parameters when compared to an FIR filter. Okay, that is about a general rule which you talk about an IIR filter and FIR filter. If phase distortion is either tolerable or unimportant, then I use an IIR filter. That means, if the system says you know phase distortions we are not bothered about it or it is tolerable or we say it, they are not important, then I go for an IIR filter. Because IIR filter implementation involves few parameters, requires less memory and has lower computational complexity. So, when you have certain relaxations like particularly in terms of distortion, then I go for IR filter because of its following advantages. What is advantages? In implementation involves few parameters. Okay, there is one important point and it requires less memory and the number of computations I used are also less. That means, the computational complexity is getting reduced.
Now let us look at causality vis-a-vis -vis its implications in the design of a digital filter. Now let us look at understand the impulse response h of n of an ideal low pass filter. The frequency response characteristic is given here. H of omega is 1. When my omega is less than or equal to omega c, that is a cutoff frequency and is 0 when omega lies between omega and pi. That means for a certain 0 to pi, we are defining this cutoff frequency. Okay, this is my response of the characteristic of the low pass filter given that is ideal. When I look at the impulse response of this filter, this h of n will be given by omega c by pi when n is equal to 0 and is equal to omega c by pi sin omega c n by omega c n when n is not equal to 0. So, this is the impulse response of the particular filter which has been given to us. Now, when I plot the h of n for omega c is equal to pi by 4 as shown in the figure next, if you see here, this is the figure which shows uh, the plot of h of n for omega c is equal to pi by 4. As seen, the ideal low pass filter is non-causal and as such cannot be realized in practice. If you look at this figure, it is very clear that the system is non-causal and any system which is not causal, we cannot implement in practically. So, what is it we have to do? Now, we have to see how best I can make the design implementable in practice. So, one solution is to introduce a large delay and not in my h of n h of n is given. So, I am introducing a delay which is large. Let us say the delay is n naught in h of n. So, what we will do is we will make h of n 0 for n less than n naught where n naught is a delay. That means, the system does not exist for n less than n naught. That means, the impulse response h of n is 0. Now, the resulting system no longer has an ideal frequency response characteristic. Of course, we have introduced a delay and we are talking about h of n becoming 0 for n less than n naught, where n is a large number, then the system is no longer an ideal characteristic. That means, the frequency response is not ideal now. Now, if we set h of n is equal to 0 for n less than n naught, the Fourier series expansion of h of mega results in Gibbs phenomenon, as you see, is not it? So, there is again another problem which we have. So, this holds for all ideal filters in general. That means, when I introduce a delay, the delay is associated with Gibbs phenomenon. So, none of the ideal characteristics are causal, all are physically unrealizable. So, ideal filter cannot be implemented as they are not causal. Let us say the necessary and sufficient conditions that a frequency response characteristic h of omega must satisfy in order for the resulting filter to be causal are the pali wiener theorem. So, once the pali wiener theorem has been satisfied, what happens is my filter becomes realizable. So, what the pali wiener theorem says? pali wiener theorem is given here. The integration from minus pi to plus pi, that is the limit. Okay, natural log h of omega d omega must be less than infinity. This is the pali wiener theorem. Conversely, if h of omega is square integrable and is finite, then we can associate with h of omega a phase response t of omega. Okay? That means, if h of omega is square integrable then and its value is finite, then what we can say? We can associate with h of omega a phase response that is theta of omega. Then I can write the resulting filter with the frequency response h of omega equal to h of omega, the magnitude of h of omega into e to the power of j theta of omega. Okay? Because this theta of omega is the phase response of the system and as you see here, this is causal. So, pali wiener theorem is what? It says that the magnitude function h of j omega can be 0 at some frequencies. So, pali wiener theorem gives us the magnitude function h of j omega which can be 0 at some frequencies and it cannot be 0 over any finite band of frequencies because the integral becomes infinite. Causality imposes some tight constraints on a linear time invariant system. Let us look at what are the constraints which causality imposes on a linear time invariant system. Now, we have said that pali wiener theorem is one of the conditions. Apart from this, what are the other conditions? Causality also implies a strong relationship between the real h r of omega and the imaginary h of omega components of the frequency response h of omega. So, h of omega is broken into two parts. h of omega can be written as a real component h r of omega plus an imaginary component h of omega. So, h of omega will be equal to h r of omega plus j h of omega as you see here. That means, we have to decompose h of n into an odd component 
and an even component. That means h of n I can write as h e of n plus h o of n. h e of n is the even component of the sequence h of n and the odd sequence h o of n represents the odd components present in your h of n. So, that is what we are doing where h of n is given by half h of n plus h of minus n that is even components and of course, odd components h of n are given by half of h of n minus h of minus n. So, you are identifying what are the odd components present and also we are identifying how to calculate the odd components of h of n. Now, h of n is causal that is what we are saying. Then I can recover h of n if or from it is even part h of h e of n when n lies between 0 and is greater than or equal to infinity and I can recover it from this odd part h o of n for n lying between 1 and greater than or equal to infinity. So, I can recover my h of n provided h of n is causal. Now, we can also see that h of n can be written as follows h of n is equal to h e of n u of n minus h e of 0 delta of n for n greater than or equal to 0 from the above equations and h of n is equal to h of 0 n of u of n plus h of 0 delta of n for n greater than or equal to 1. That means, I can write h of n exclusively in terms of even components of h and also I can also write h of n exclusively in terms of odd components. So, we have written that here h of n can be written as 2 h e of n u of n minus h e of 0 delta of n whenever n is greater than or equal to 0 and h of n can be written in terms of odd components 2 h of 0 of n u of n plus h of 0 delta of n for n greater than or equal to 1. This is because h 0 of n is equal to 0 for n is equal to 0 we cannot recover h of 0 from h 0 of n we cannot recover because h 0 of n does not exist for 0. As you see the limits n is lying between 1 and infinity. So, at 0 it does not exist. So, I cannot have or use or the odd component h 0 of n for n is equal to 0. Okay? So, h 0 of n we also must know that is given by h e of n for n greater than or equal to 1. As such there is a very strong relationship between h 0 of n and h e of n. Now, if h of n is b i b o stable that is it is bounded input and bounded output stable a frequency response exists and h of omega is given by h r of omega plus j h i of omega. h of n is completely specified by h e of n, h of omega is completely determined if you know h r of omega. So, h of n is completely specified by h e of n, h of omega is completely determined if you know h r of omega that means if h e n can be completely specified by the even component then h of omega can be completely determined if you know only the real part of h that is h r of omega or h of omega is completely determined from h i of omega and h 0 h of 0. So, if I know h of 0 and if I know what is h of uh, h i of omega I can recall h of omega ok. So, that is how we h of n can be established or re recovered or can be written in terms of h e of n that is even components plus h o of n. Similarly, h of omega can be recovered fully from its real components and imaginary components. From the real components if it is completely if h of n is completely specified by the only the even h e of n then I can recover h of omega completely from only h r of omega that is the real part of omega. Okay. Similarly, I can also recover h of omega completely from h i of omega and the fact that I know what is my value at h of 0 because odd components cannot determine the value of h of 0. So, if I know this I can actually recover h of omega from h r of omega or h i of omega. If you see here h r of omega and h i of omega are independent and cannot be specified independently if the system is causal. Equivalently, the magnitude phase responses of a causal filter are interdependent and cannot be specified independently. Given h r of omega for a corresponding real even and absolutely summable sequence h g of n, we can determine h of omega. That means, h r of omega of corresponding for a real even and absolutely summable sequence h g of n, we can determine h of omega. Now, the relationship between the imaginary components of the Fourier transform are absolutely summable causal and real sequence is h of omega as we have seen earlier we have written in terms of h r of omega plus j h i of omega 
which I can write in terms of the Fourier transform. So, I can write this as equal to 1 by pi integral limits extending from minus pi to plus pi h r of lambda u of omega minus lambda d lambda minus h u of 0. Okay, this is how I can establish a relationship between the Fourier transform and h of omega, where u of omega is the Fourier transform of the unit step sequence u of n and the unit step response has a Fourier transform u of omega is equal to pi of delta of omega plus 1 by 1 minus e to the power of minus j omega that is equal to pi of delta of omega plus half minus j 1 by 2 cot omega by 2 for a limits omega existing between minus pi to plus pi. The relationship between h r of omega the real component of h of omega and h i of omega the imaginary component of h of omega is given by this following relationship. So, what is the relation? h i of omega I can write in terms of minus 1 by 2 pi integral the limits are from minus pi to plus pi h r of omega lambda cot of omega minus lambda by 2 d lambda. This integral is called as a discrete Hilbert transform. Now, let us look at the importance of causality and its implications in the design of frequency selective filters. The first point the frequency response h of omega cannot be 0 except at finite set of points in the frequency. The frequency response h of omega cannot be 0 except at finite set of points in frequency. The magnitude h of omega cannot be constant in a finite range of frequencies and the transition of the pass band stop band cannot be infinitely sharp. So, there is a Gibbs phenomenon associated with the truncation of h of n to achieve causality. That means, the transition from one band to another band is never smooth or is never sharp. There will be some associated Gibbs phenomenon which are side lobes which are present. So, Gibbs phenomenon is an addition or is an extra which we got because we have made the system causal. Third point the real and imaginary parts of h omega are interdependent and are related by the discrete Hilbert transform. As a consequence, the magnitude h of omega and phase state of omega h of omega cannot be chosen arbitrarily. So, they are interdependent, they are not independent. Okay? So, the calculation of magnitude and phase cannot be chosen arbitrarily. Now, causality imposes lot of restrictions on the frequency response characteristic of the filter. Ideal filters are not achievable in practice. So, causality must be implemented. As such, the implementable design belongs to the class of LTI systems given in the, by the following difference equation. So, what is the equation? Y of n is equal to minus summation k is equal to 1 to capital N a k y of n minus k plus summation k is equal to 1 to m b k x of n minus k. These systems have frequency response h of j omega given by in the numerator summation k is equal to 1 to m b k e to the power of minus j omega k divided by 1 plus summation k is equal to 1 to n a k e to the power of minus j omega k. Now, what is the basic digital filter design problem? You have to approximate any of the ideal frequency response characteristics with the system that has the frequency response by choosing properly the coefficients a k and b k. That means, an ideal filter cannot be implemented because it is non causal. So, we have to make it a causal to make it causal we have to choose the frequency response properly the coefficients of a k and b k. 